We are live, I assume. It's recording. All right. Um, so uh, we want to uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Myland Tusis, for joining us this evening. We are very excited for this conversation. And uh, Terry and I uh, have known Mylan for many years and, and following Mylan's work and, and uh, had lots of really great conversation with Mylan over the years. And, uh, and so I'll do a brief introduction of Mylan, and then we're going to open it up to you to introduce yourself in whatever way you, whatever way you would like to. And so uh, tonight we're joined by Mylan Tchusis, who is from Palmaker, Saskatchewan. He uh, completed his Master's of Arts in Indigenous Governance in 2013. He has participated in many land-based education programs across the world. He's a certified, certified life coach and is currently a doctoral student in the Department of Indigenous Studies at the U of S. His research concentrates on Indigenous political ecolo ecology sorry, of the prairie. And he has a podcast. Mylan's podcast is called The Radical Narrative. And so please check out Mylan's podcast. And that can be found on, I would assume, all uh, platforms. And Mylan, I'm sure, will talk about that as well, I hope. And so yeah. Mylan, we want to open it up to you and invite you to introduce yourself and uh, get started on this really great conversation. Great. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for inviting me back. I know I got a chance to go over there and actually present and, and talk story a number of years ago, I think a few times, actually. Um, you guys are doing great work over there. It's really cool to see. And yeah, I'm glad to be back in the online format during the pandemic. Um, but yeah, my name is Mylon Tatusis. I come from Palmaker Indian Reserve in Treaty 6 Territory. Um, that's where I live right now. Um, that's where I'm based out of. And yes, I am doing my PhD. I'm still a PhD student in this pandemic. Um, still grinding in that and working and living the pandemic life, just as everybody is um, working from home mainly. Um, but that's who I am and where I come from. Yeah. And I'm excited to be to be here and talk story about what we're going to talk about today. When I was muted. Um, so you have a, a bit of a PowerPoint that you're going to share with us. And so our hope is, and, and we talked prior to um, coming on, is that we are going to have a bit of an organic conversation. Um, and uh, so if you want to just give her, Mylan, just oh. give her. And then yeah. we'll, uh, <laughs> we're here to learn from you as well. So yeah, please yeah. Us. Great. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And that has always been sort of like our flow is always learning from each other and talking story and, and just giving insights because I know we're both working in education in the post-secondary level. Um, and yeah, I mean, in all honesty, this, this workshop and this sort of PowerPoint kind of came out like the last within the pandemic times of, of what do I want to highlight and, and what do I want to concentrate on to be able to sort of explain the conditions we're in, but more importantly, how do we support and continue to support Indigenous students who are navigating the academy, navigating post-secondary education on all levels. Um, like I said, I've been in, in the field for quite a while just as an Indigenous student, but also as an Indigenous instructor, both sides of the classroom. So I really try and make space and foster conversation around helping our students survive because you know we sometimes suck at lose we suck at um at um keeping track of our students sometimes especially how the academic system is structured we know who's coming into the room we know enrollment we know enrollment numbers and things like that but we don't necessarily know what happens to the students who don't come back or we don't know what happens to the student who stops coming to class and that's always bugged me as a professor or sorry as an instructor not a professor yet maybe one day um and that's something i wanted to address so uh, me and terry having conversations and just bouncing ideas off each other i kind of said hey look i developed this and i want to talk about this and she said great come here and talk about it so she gave me the space to do this so i'm excited to present this um initially i called this talk in this workshop module i developed the history of colonialism and its impacts on the indigenous student experience um, because i wanted to center obviously how things are an ongoing problem for us and what continues to be going on on our home fronts, on our family, familial fronts and things like that. But I shifted it a little bit. I wanna concentrate on understanding colonialism outside the clash of paradigms. Um, and the reason why I did that title change is because we're getting really good at now in this era, just 
sort of look at the clash of Western and indigenous, like, you know, what, what's the Western world doing and, and how is it interfering with us? So there's, there's sort of like this clash and we see it economically. We obviously see it politically and it does exist on campuses where indigenous spaces aren't necessarily fostered. So we're going to jump into that. And I kind of want to step outside that clash and, and concentrate more importantly, like I said, on the indigenous student experience. Um, because yeah, we could go to, you know, we could go to indigenous studies class or we could go to poli sci clash and participate in that clash. But from our perspective of educators in terms of fostering and supporting students, I feel it's necessary for us to sort of step out of that and look specifically at what are the students needs. Um, so yeah, I'll position myself. My name is Myla Institusis. I'm, I'm from Palm Acre, Treaty 6 territory. Um, I have a daughter. I'm a father. My partner is watching right now. My partner and my daughter, I think, are signed in watching right now. Um, and yeah, this is sort of who I am, and this is who I choose to embody in terms of who I am and where I come from as an Indigenous cisgendered male um, um, in, a, in a relationship and raising our daughter together here out in Palm Acre the best we can. Um, I dance, obviously. Um, been active in the social front for a while, obviously with justice for Colton and supporting my sister Jade, and again raising my daughter, and you know again having the opportunity to travel and spend time in Zapatista territory and things like that. Do my best to maintain our culture and our tradition, um, and in our my own way, the best way I know how. And I come from Pamika, right? So it's a very important place in terms of who I am uh, as an uh, Nahea Poatuk, Plains Cree Nakota male. Um, of course, when I position my talks, I always want to position the fact that uh, Palm Acre Indian Reserve has a very real uh, colonial history because we were attacked here May 2nd, 1985 um, by the Northwest Mountain Police and Colonel Otter and um, some British infantry came and essentially wanted to eradicate us. Like their goal was to teach us a lesson and erase us. Um, but they failed, obviously, right? They obviously failed. I'm here today. My daughter is here today. Here's a photo of her walking on the land, just down the hill from where this photo was taken. Um, so obviously they failed. And I want to position that in terms of who I am, because like I said, we do talk about clashes. We do talk about um, the clash that does exist between us. And that's an example of that. But again, what I want to talk about today specifically is to basically step out of that clash and just have a real conversation about where we're at as Indigenous people. First and foremost, my object objective is to understand the reality of Indigenous people in context of colonialism, and, and I do feel like the Indigenous audience probably gets a, gets a pretty good <laughs> comprehension of that because we're living it, um, but I'll touch on some key aspects of that. Um, and one key thing in terms of educators and, and people who are working in, in um, university settings is we have to better understand the chaos that students are going through because it is a chaotic world we're living in, in terms of having experienced colonialism, having experienced trauma. And that's still a very real aspect of, of the dynamics we have to navigate. And that's a very real reality for a lot of Indigenous students who make their way into post-secondary. So I want to position that and become make us more aware of that. And again, obviously, we want, we want to have a conversation on a way where we can I could give insight on how to better accommodate Indigenous students, and, and that's a conversation we could have at the end. First things first, I really want to position a decolonial scholar. I always like positioning France Fanon's work, especially for young scholars and academics who are observing my talks, are observing what I do. If you need someone to cite in your papers, if you need somebody to look into critically, just in terms of the chaos we're navigating, read Frantz Fanon, right? Frantz Fanon was a decolonial scholar. He's basically the grandfather of decolonization. He was coming up with a lot of the terminology and structural theory we use today. Uh, he was from French Martinique. I always include a slide like this in my first, my presentations to better articulate, you know, again, position myself, position my politics and, and my frame of mind. Um, but again, direct quote from Frantz Fanon, um, in the colonial countries, the policeman and the soldier, by their immediate presence and their frequent and direct action, maintain contact with the native and advise them by means of rifle butts and napalm not to budge. It is obvious here that the agents of government speak the language of pure force. The intimidatory does not lighten the oppression nor seek to hide the domination. He shows up with them and puts them into practice with a clear conscience of an upholder of the peace. Yet he is the bringer of violence into the home and into the mind of the native. Direct quote from Franz Fanon, sort of positioning my work and, and what I look at critically in terms of colonialism and ultimately decolonization, what we will talk about. Um, this photo here is actually from um, out east at Belisitog uh, a number of years back. Some people will remember 
they were resisting oil and gas um, exploration there and the military literally was called in. It's I love this photo for all the wrong reasons because it is a very graphic image of how colonialism can look, um, how it could look in a very physical, violent way, right? Even this dog here is ready to, to attack. Um, and Francis Fernando was on point with calling this. This quote would have came from the 1960s. This event would have just happened a few years ago in the uh, early 2000s. Um, so he was really on point with his analysis. One thing I want to zero in on with this quote is how settlers and how the colonizers or the oppressors do what they do with the clear conscience conscience of an upholder of peace. It's almost like it's an unconscious paradigm where we tend to assume that the colonial way is the right way, where we tend to assume that the colonial economy, the colonial education system, the colonial political system is the right way. And a lot of people aren't aware of that. Like a lot of even settlers and non-Indigenous people have this clear conscience that they kind of think they're doing the right thing. But as we're going to highlight today, they're not, right? There's clashes here. Again, I'm going to position how we're going to talk about this a bit later in the slides, just bear with me. So first and foremost, to understand Indigenous peoples in context, into, in context to colonialism. So further, I guess, like positioning myself in terms of my education system and how I view who I am and where I come from, I really want to position the Plains Cree worldview. If there's Indigenous students listening to this, I'm giving you a lot of pointers by introducing you to France Fanon early and also want to remind you to assert your Indigenous identity and stand in the truth of who you are. Um, because for me, our, our Plains Cree worldview, Niheo it's 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 still very active and real for me that I have to be mindful and conscience, conscious of, of the type of worldview I'm trying to maintain and foster through our stories, through our language, through our songs, through our dances, and even through our cosmology. Um, and some key things I wanted to highlight first and foremost when we get into positioning colonialism is highlight what we had. And this is just a very surface level conversation. A lot of people could talk about this stuff for days, obviously, and, and Muslims and Kukums have way more knowledge than I do. But I really like to touch on this just so people get a sort of understanding and taste of it, that in Plains Creek cosmology, the family system and our children were dear to us. It was like a main component of how we lived and governed our lives. And even when you break it down within our stories, children's, children are gifts from the creator, autonomous beings, like literal little spirit beings gifted to us from the creator. So the family system was a big part of our our, our worldview, our education system, our governance system, our economic system, if you want to call it that, and just how we were related to the landscape. Obviously, we centered our language, and there's a lot of amazing language work today that's taking place where we're reclaiming our language, win. even our song as a form of language, we're reclaiming and practicing and, and, and singing our songs again, even openly. Um, that's an amazing thing to see, and that was a big part of our worldview. Um, community and nation people, uh, nation-oriented, like people-oriented, we were more centered around nation-building already prior to contact because our peoplehood and who we were and where we came from were very, were very important to how we went about making decisions. So we were community and nation-oriented, and we have to remind ourselves of that, especially today in post-secondary institutions because there's a lot of work that's trying to promote individual thinking, individual doing that sort of separates from that, that concept and practice we had. Um, the maintenance of ongoing land-based relationships are paramount in our worldview and our cultural practices, our environmental practices. Kinship-based systems, like I highlighted, families was really important to who we are. We had our natural laws and our spiritual laws. So those are very real in terms of how we interacted with the world, how we governed ourselves, and, and how we maintained who we are and where we came from. Of course, we had our own legal systems. Highly mobile in North America. Highly mobile across vast territories, transboundary even. Um, yeah, we could talk about that later. Um, but worldview and history maintained through oral history, right? So we had a very strong component of oral history within our and within our paradigms. But not to mitigate the fact that Plains uh, Cree people and the Hayawak people, we also have a writing system. We have a writing system that was gifted to us from the Creator. A lot of our old people um, went to residential school already knowing how to write in, in our language. And that was a big irony that was overlooked in the past. So we got to keep in mind that we're also a people that come from a writing system. Compassion and love for one another, peace and diplomacy, right? I really want to situate some of these concepts just on the surface level before we dive into some of what we're going to talk about. 
But when, if we look at specifically who we were, we know that things changed, right? We know that colonialism took place. Um, and if you were just to look at the basic definition of what colonialism is, just the basic, uh, basic dictionary definition, is basically a control by one power over an area, right? And of course, it looks and is tied to the colonial era. Um, and it's also a policy advocating or based on control of another group of people and their territories. For me, colonialism exists socially, politically, economically, and environmentally. Um, it not only exists historically, but it also exists currently, right? So when we look at the concept of policy, we got to keep in mind that policy exists socially, politically, economically, and environmentally today, right? This is still an ongoing dynamic. I know a lot of historians, I know a lot of Western scholars like to look at colonialism as something that happened in the past, but if you just look at it from the policy perspective, if you just look at it from the social relations perspective of, of non-Indigenous people living on Indigenous lands, you're going to see colonialism still play out socially, politically, economically, and environmentally through the state, through the settler state, right? So I wanted to highlight that dynamic also as we move along and getting into the education component. So general impacts of colonization. There's still a lot of trauma here for us. There's still a lot of chaos for our family systems and our, communicate, our communities. Um, this, this sort of, um, this general impact sort of definition and framework comes from Adrian Tanner's work where he was working with the James Bay Cree up in Ontario, where he looked at how the hydroelectric damming impacted their um, communities. And so he kind of highlighted these four key things that took place in the territory once their landscape was drastically changed. Uh, the first thing that took place was literally a disorientation, right? Because now you can't access the traditional lands. Now you can't go out there and maintain who you are and where you come from because it's literally underwater, right? So now what do I do? Now where do I go, right? literally a disempowerment where there is now a low self-esteem where roles and responsibilities tied to that landscape can no longer be fulfilled, right? Now we have to live in the town site. Now we have to live in town, completely different way of thinking, way of doing and way of functioning, right? A lot of abuse, shame, oppression taking place in those spaces that were completely against like the social structure that many people were used to uh, and literally a physical and legal disempowerment, right? To say you can't go there anymore, so don't bother trying to go there. That's a very real form of oppression. And literally the result of that oppression is a feeling and sense of being disempowered, right? I don't have access to that anymore. I have nothing to do. So there's a frustration there. And discord because now everybody's sort of in the same boat and everyone's trying to come up with a way to problem solve and say what's next, right? So there's a lot of finger pointing, right? This is where it gets into the res poly hashtag where some of those behaviors aren't the best behaviors with people, right? Because everyone's pointing fingers, everyone's judging one another. That's the very real fallout of colonialism that's impacting us politically and socially through policy and even economically through policy. It's designed to create discord where we don't get along with one another. And disease, right? So literally, if you look at the example of Adrian Tanner's work, no longer access to no, no, no longer being able to access traditional foods, um, not being able to highlight um, access the, um, um, the traditional territory to hunt, right? So having to maintain a relationship to the store, right? Getting your pop in chips at the store. That's a very real colonial dynamic, even though it's funny, right? Because it, it is everyone has their secret uh, res store order that they tell their family to pick up for them when they go, right? Mine's the mesquite barbecue chips and a Dr. Pepper, right? And all the Indians know their little flavors. They all know what they like at the res store, right? But the very real reality is, is that that is a form of colonialism because now we no longer have access to the traditional foods that sustained us, right? We no longer have access to those foods and that's causing very real health impacts in our community, very real um, lack of nutritional density in our diet to the point where we have an inferior nutrition and we and again that's a very real um, social determinant of of health and in, in our communities that we have to be mindful of but the point i really want to get across here tying this into education is that this is still a very real reality for many of our communities many of our people we're still going through this and we have to be mindful of it we have to start to turn the light it's on, see it and structure it in order to address it. We're coming from highly vulnerable communities and that vulnerability extends to young people. That vulnerability extends to the individuals who, are, who want to go to school, who want to get an education, who want to better their lives, right? So this vulnerability 
because of the chaos of colonialism, literally is the clouded minds and clouded hearts. And I remember my late father sort of highlighting it in that way to me, where people can't think clearly and they can't feel clearly, clearly because there's so much going on. There's so much that has happened, right? And there's a lot of confusion. And one of the goals we have to do is establish clarity for those of Oh, I think I got a spelling mistake here, but we need to establish clarity of where we come from and the world we're going to live in, of who we are, where we come from, and the world we want to live in, right? So we have to structure this and become more mindful of this and aware of this to be able to sort of lift the fog from what we're feeling sometimes, from what we're thinking sometimes, because it's all by design when you look at colonialism and jump into that conversation. So the link I want to make here specifically is that we're dealing with people who have been through colonialism, have been through colonization, have traumas, and they're making their way into university systems, right? And that's why I want to step out of this clash of, of Western versus Indigenous right now. I really want to position and foster, well, if I'm working with somebody who has trauma and is vulnerable, what am I doing to encourage that they're in a, multi, in a healthy mental state to be able to navigate the system they're in? Because if I don't do that as an educator, if I don't do that as a student advisor or as a mentor, then I'm doing them a disservice. It's almost as if I'm just handing them over to the university and say, do what you want with them, right? Because we have to unpack this. We have to structure this for our students to, to be mindful of, right? Because we, do, we are coming out of a legacy of failed education systems. We know that the residential school system was toxic. It was traumatic. It didn't work, right? And it caused a lot of the traumas that our people are going through today. And I'm not justifying education systems. I'm not justifying universities whatsoever. What I'm simply saying and highlighting is that we have young people going into these systems and into these institutions, and we have to be willing to, to support them the best we can to be able to navigate those the best they can. Because again, we're coming out of colon, uh, colonization and colonialism uh, with very real problems and very real issues that we need to address on the personal level, the family level, and the community level. So that's how this ties into education, right? That's why I like to step out of the clash of paradigms because we could theorize that, we could write about that, we could publish books on that. But for me as an educator, I wanna be in the position to ensure that this student is, is in a healthy place to be able to navigate the system and survive the system. My goal isn't to get them to go to class. My goal is to get them out the door and survive the system that they went through, right? Um, so to understand the chaos of col the, that colonialism has on individuals, so now that we're sort of shifting focus to the Indigenous student experience, uh, right now I'm working with the Indian Teachers Education Program at the University of Saskatchewan. I'm their long distance mentor, and I sort of have a different metric for helping students. Um, yes, I want to ensure that they're getting the grades, the best grades they can, that they're getting their assignments in on time. Um, but more importantly, I want to ensure that there's mental clarity there, that their mental health is taken care of, that they feel supported and, and, and heard in terms of the chaos that they're trying to navigate. So my metric isn't necessarily those grades or that writing assignment. My metric is simply their overall mental health. Are they confident enough to continue? Um, so it's a completely different metric for me than, you know, um, some, some uh, uh, academic advisors or some academic support systems is a completely different uh, approach that I take when I work with my students. Um, because the reality is, is that there's types of colonialism and oppression being navigated by Indigenous students on the fly. These aren't just classes they're taking. These aren't just simply theories that they're learning, that, that because of the history of colonization and how it hasn't been remedied, that there's very real um, issues they have to navigate in relation to themselves and in relation to the content that they're learning, right? So if you look at social content, right? We're living in a very racist society. We know that, right? We know that oppression is taking place. Um, the daily life of being indigenous um, under a settler state is full of violence. It's full of health concerns, right? There's a lot of conversations that happen in classrooms that are very real time conversations. So the students navigating that, right? Same with economic, right? Economic development, all the sort of economic business stuff, labor and wage economy, all this stuff being forced um, where we have to force to survive and find our livelihood. Um, looking at the cost of land and lifestyle and who we want to become, that's a very real colonial reality that young people need to navigate is what's my economic analysis? What type of economic systems do I foster and believe in? And this is coming at, we're navigating this coming out of it from coming out of the legacy of residential schools and, and still living in a very colonial society, coming at it from the issue of me not being fully 
able to, to live the life I want as an indigenous person. So now I have to subscribe to certain ideas, certain political theories, certain economic theories, be able to navigate that on the fly. So it kind of gets really problematic because a lot of students get bogged down with this conversation. And I know I did as an undergraduate and graduate in, in grad school. Um, again, political colonialism is still taking place. We see that, that with um, settler politics. We see that with cross Canada politics, right? Legal battles, legal jargon, policy and law, federalism, and ongoing efforts of Canadian assimilation, right? So that's a very real dynamic that our students are navigating on the fly and wanting to find a remedy to in some cases. And again, we're still navigating environmental colonialism, literal devastation of lands, climate change, an ongoing thing. It's an ongoing factor that's in the back of the minds of a lot of young people, right? So we have to be mindful of this stuff. And this is the type of stuff that a lot of Indigenous students are attempting to navigate and um, find solutions to. But at the same time, we're coming at it from very real uh, colonial systems and very colonial um, experiences overall. So what I really wanted to highlight was that the university isn't necessarily, um, how could I say this? Um, we have to be mindful of this in terms of education because the university systems do foster certain agendas, they do foster certain theories, right? And we have to be mindful that students who are in a vulnerable state are sometimes learning these theories from a vulnerable state. So it may, they may not be in the best mind or the men, best mental clarity that, that they can be in to be able to make a decision when it comes to a lot of the political theory, a lot of the economic theory that, that um, we have to learn in these university settings. So that's why mentorship comes into play. That's why fostering trauma-informed approaches with your student, um, student, um, um, your student um, advising teams and things like that. Um, because the reality is that we're still facing ongoing Canadian colonialism, right? The colonial agenda is still heavily promoted by largely pro-assimilation pro media, pro-assimilation is media and mainstream non-Indigenous scholars. Right, so there's a lot of there's a plethora of non-indigenous scholars out there with their own political theory, and a lot of these battles are, battles are taking place in academic settings. Um, and again, a lot of the goal for a lot of those scholars who are pro-assimilationist, pro-settler state, is ultimately the goal of integration of our people into market economy, cultural assimilation, advances the only viable pathways to better the life of indigenous people and communities. We have to be mindful of that because our students are going to be navigating this on the fly. All right. So if they pick up that book, if they pick up that content that is really pro assimilationist, you know, we have to be mindful of that. We have to be mindful of what they're going to be processing and how they're going to choose to navigate that. So with ongoing Canadian colonialism slide, I really wanted to highlight that um, there is still ongoing issues. There's still ongoing issues that students are going to have to navigate and, 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 um, and find solutions to in some cases. So this perspective is also at the center of government policy, as we all know, right? We all know that there's an ongoing settler state agenda taking place. It is fair to say that forms, this forms the vast majority of the Canadian population where the Canadian population tends to assume that, you know, colonialism is the way to go and that the Canadian state is the way to go. So it's really problematic in that way. It's really problematic in a way where we have to be mindful of what our Indigenous students are going through. And again, that link between, um, you know, coming at it from the failed legacy of residential schools, coming at it from the failed legacy of um, 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 the settler state trying to sort of remedy, uh, provide some sort of education to our people, our, our students are really struggling, especially in the, in the current pandemic times. So why place and land matters? We have to really take a big shift in focus, right? We have to take a big shift in focus and structure. Um, we have to structure basically, sorry, my daughter is knocking at the door. One second. Okay. Um, so why place in land matters? We have to really restructure and foster indigenous students in a way where, again, when we're going back to that uh, Plains Cree worldview, uh, we have to position that as primary. <laughs> Right, because we do know that settler colonialism is an ongoing effort to remove us and erase us from our land and literally make that land their territory, their source of capital, their home. Right. So at the same time, the land is central to our livelihood, our history, and our futures. Right. And it's constantly con contested within the colonial systems. All right, so we have to be very mindful of this in, in two ways. One, we have to be mindful in terms of it, in terms of who we are as Indigenous people, wanting to re-engage that land 
And secondly, that we're actively working in institutions where students have to uh, have to subscribe to certain ideas pertaining to this land, to this place, right? And it's a very ongoing, real colonial dynamic that we have to be mindful of. Um, and again, coming at it from the position of wanting to support the students to have the best possible outcome to survive those battles is where I dedicate my my time and effort to, um, because again, the critical. Uh, the critical conflict that's taking place right now is ba basically who, acts who has access to land and water, right? who has access to our land and water. Um, and again, very real colonial issues and dynamics taking place here. So again, when we look at Frantz Fanon, I introduced this to indigenous scholars in the beginning, the young indigenous scholars, someone to look into. Another quote by Fanon in order to center this conversation around land and why decolonization is important in terms of students, um, uh, indigenous student experiences. Fanon was on point again, right? So if we looked at why place and land matters and how settler colonialism is trying to take that over, assume authority over it and limit our access to it, Fanon was on point, right? For Fanon, decolonization was very simple. It was simply land back, right? That's the phrase a lot of young people are saying today, land back. And it's really rooted in what I view as uh, Fanonian decolonization because Fanon did say for colonized people, the most essential value because the most concrete is first and foremost the land, the land which will bring them bread and above all dignity. So when you look at Franz Fanon from that perspective, a very popular quote here from Rest of the Earth, uh, from the perspective of livelihood, the concept of bread literally is tied to land where we have to find a way to, to better our livelihood. We have to find a way to um, maintain our livelihood and through Fanon, that was through accessing land, that was through accessing um, our territory again, our, uh, the territory and the, the projects he was involved in. So let's unpack what Fanon means here, right? Um, when we're looking at France Fanon and we're looking at decolonization, there's a lot of fear around, around France Fanonian decolonization and what he was actually meaning. Um, some students could look into that if you're really interested in it. You could shoot me a DM. We could have conversations about this all day because this is what I look at in my PhD work. Um, but I really want to foster the Tuck and Yang definition from their 2012 article, uh, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. Um, they quoted as specifically decolonization brings about the reparation of indigenous land and life. <laughs> Right. So now if you're looking at how colonial systems in general, how I highlighted colonial systems are, you know, basically capitalizing off our vulnerability, um, teaching us certain theories and, and getting us to invest in certain academic systems that could be problematic. Uh, the Tuck and Yang article around education really centers land and life, right? It really takes us back to the beginning where it says, well, it's all about land, right? Um, and the direct quote is, it's not a metaphor for other things we want to do to improve our societies and schools. There's a very literal concrete value here to the conversation around education that we need to get into. So one key thing, uh, we just had a conversation about this in a, a meeting I was in, our, in a class I was in earlier this week, is how decolonization is not reconciliation. Um, because the confusion comes in this day and age that, you know, reconciliation is decolonization and a lot of institutions subscribe to that. And that's not necessarily the case, right? Reconciliation and empowerment through economic development as the expected outcomes of self-government and process, land claims agreements and Aboriginal rights and title strategies have not materialized, right? There's a very real legal interference taking place. Um, there's also the aspect of reconciliation being economic based, right? Where economic control is sort of fostered as, as um, the be all end all to solving the, the issue of colonization, but that's not the case at all, right? There's a lot of social investment into uh, reconciliation through institutions. And again, that may not necessarily be the best avenue of reconciliation. If we take it back home to here to land and life, right? The Tuck and Ying article is very concrete, right? Like Fanon said, very concrete because the most concrete is land, right? So now we're getting to the land back conversations and tying that into the indigenous student experience. So decolonization does require work, right? So the reality is, is that indigenous students are navigating colonial systems and wanting to advocate for decolonization. It does require work. It does require alternative ways of thinking and doing. Like Tuck and Yang say, it's not a metaphor. It requires restitution of certain lands, certain rights. And it literally requires a disruption of systems, right? The political, economic, social, and ecological systems. Um, and we got to keep that in mind when we're looking at the indigenous student experience and tying that back into the overall legacy and the colonial legacy of how 
academic systems have not necessarily had the best um, outcomes for our people, we have to tie in the fact that a lot of Indigenous students are navigating these on the fly and that we want to have them survive the systems that they're in in order to come out on the other end and be who, true to who they are and where they come from. So one thing I wanted to highlight in particular um, is how there's a certain problem that exists on campuses across Canada and the United States. There's a lot of critique coming out of uh, university systems today uh, from the Indigenous student perspective, but also just from uh, the Black Indigenous person of color experience. Um, when we look at indigenous effort, indigenization efforts, in particular, the ones I've been uh, participating in and involved in, um, it's, it's been very problematic in some cases. And one key thing I really wanted to highlight is that how surface level it is. Um, there's appointment of indigenous peoples into administrative positions. Yes, small victory, small win. Increase in indigenous enrollment. Cool, yes, small victory, small win. And a lot of indigenous marketing materials. Um, but one of the big key issues that sort of came out in my experience in universities in the, last, in the last 10 years was that Indigenous peoples and students are put in positions to structure and create the Indigenization through committees, jobs, and gigs, where we become the labor force that sort of leads the charge on how Indigenization is going to look. And again, that Indigenization falling into sort of this, this brand of reconciliation. Um, right now, there's a very big push at the University of Saskatchewan by the Indigenous students to want to start an Indigenous student union on the undergraduate level simply because they felt like they were being taken advantage of in terms of having the structure and address very real structural problems. And we'll talk a bit about that in the following slides. Um, and again, Indigenous students, staff and faculty are called on to save and alter the system that has been a problem. And it's literally not my job to do that. Um, and like I highlighted earlier in the current positions I'm in, my metrics are very different for working with Indigenous students. I want to ensure that they have the support system to be able to navigate the system, not so much concentrating on how well um, their assignments are per se, even though we do do that, even though I also tutor Indigenous students also. And we got to keep in mind that to save and rescue these colonial systems, it's an act of violence because now we're starting to call on our own people to justify and rescue systems that have been inherently problematic to us, right? Very uh, traumatic experiences in terms of not only residential school, but also just, you know, the, the approach that university systems have taken in the past. And I'm going to highlight some of that as we move along um, into the later slides. So, how do we better accommodate Indigenous students? And I really wanted to bring in um, Terry and Amber in this and have a general conversation about this too, because now we're highlighted, not only did we highlight specifically the chaos of colonialism, but we also highlighted ideally how colonialism plays out in these institutions today and how we have to strive for the alternative, which is you know, decolonization and how it exists in multiple fields. Um, but more importantly, we have to be mindful that our young people are navigating these systems in a way where um, there's a lot of trauma taking place um, there's a lot of um, issues that may be, you know, coming up for students and that some of these institutions and places may not be the safest, safest place to have some conversations. They may not be the safest place to find the solutions that our people in our communities need. So I wanted to give insight on how to better accommodate Indigenous students. Um, so what ways can we better accommodate Indigenous students? And this is based off my experience working as an online distance coordinator, uh, working on a mental health team for a local high school also. But these are some of the key things that I sort of concentrated on in, in terms of my delivery and I wanted to offer them up to the audience to be able to think about and reflect on and, and maybe even implement wherever they're working. Um, key one being, and they're not in any order, I just sort of jotted them down. They're not in like, a, they're not numbered. Um, so they're just general, general things. Um, but Number one, well, I wouldn't even call it number one. I think one key thing is sort of truth telling in a safe space and um, in a safe space and honesty in general, how we have to be very mindful of creating these safe spaces. And I know that uh, Terry and Amber in particular are really good at that because they get me over there to do these talks and it is a very safe space to do these talks and have safe space for students. But that's one key element that a lot of students need to, be, to begin to experience is feeling safe enough to speak the truth feeling safe enough to speak to the colonial reality that we're navigating in mainstream society, feeling safe enough to be able to critique even, you know, the chaos that we're experiencing in a colonial society. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the other one that sort of came up for me when I was sort of developing the slides and these modules is a space to be present and assert self and autonomy. Indigenous students need a space to be present and assert themselves and their overall autonomy to have those conversations and have those discourses play out where they could begin to facilitate the conversations they want to have. So again, there's a very physical space that needs to be fostered. Um, and there's also a, like a community space that needs to be fostered. Um, indigenous students do need these types of spaces to be able to assert themselves and, and their um, autonomy. Um, more importantly, uh, be free to learn. Like one key advice I like to give students in general is that be free to learn and experience a diversity of knowledges, paradigms without subscribing to them. Um, because again, university systems, we sort of start to advocate disciplines and majors. Uh, we sort of start to advocate, you know, students starting to get into very specific ways of thinking, <laughs> modes of functioning. But we got to be able to foster our students in a way where we could make it okay for them to not necessarily subscribe to all the ideas, but be willing to learn from a diversity of knowledges and paradigms. Again, the subscription to ideas is a very real um, setback in some communities and some circles because there's clashes that could result from that. Um, understand history and settler colonialism. I've always said and I've always advocated for the fact that we need to start talking about the colonial history as early as we can, even if it's in high school and middle school systems, begin to navigate that and let our students know it exists and how to structure that problem. And again, it has to happen before any formal academic programming happens because I literally heard the arguments um, I literally heard arguments coming from some, uh, some institutions where they said that uh, Indigenous students could learn about uh, decolonization in grad school, right? They could learn about decolonization in their master's programs, which is just not cool, right? <laughs> because, because obviously for obvious reasons, right? Um, so like that sort of um, understanding around the problems we're talking about, settler colonialism and colonization, um, they have to happen fairly quickly, sooner the better, because once we're structurally aware of the problem, we will be able to navigate um, university systems better and smoothly. Can I just jump in there, Mylan? Um, me and Amber were just having a conversation about that. And I think that, you know, this is one of the things that um, we've experienced having um, been in Blue Quills University was having to unpack that stuff right off the bat. And on Oftentimes within Western institutions, we do not see that. Um, and there's such a huge importance to that. I think that, you know, when we are trying to remain rooted in who we are as Indigenous people or Indigenous students um, and, and staying connected to our identity in these spaces, uh, wow. that we have to have that understanding and that history um, of colonialism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily... <laughs> have that opportunity in most institutions to do that. And then I also think that one of the things that we've done a really good job with is that we have um, placed understanding colonialism to specific disciplines mm -hmm. so that there's only specific disciplines that really need to understand colonialism, social work being one. Yeah. And so we have social work students who are coming into our program at McEwen and the very first class they have is with me mm -hmm. and the whole class is about understanding the history of this country yeah. but I know yeah. that not every program has that and so I think about how we've gotten like we've we've placed responsibility of understanding colonialism with specific yeah. disciplines and I think that that's really unfair to students is that they don't get that in every program and then, you know, they hear about social work students doing that and they'll say, well, why haven't we learned that? Mm -hmm. And why isn't this part of our curriculum? And so I think that we've also done that really well in, in universities as well. Yeah, yeah, totally. Definitely on point and I agree with you. And, and yeah, like that, that's partly why, you know, this sort of awareness is coming up for me too, is because there is sort of like this split in knowledge systems. Um, and again, like, just to hit home the fact, like like we're all saying, is that Indigenous students should have access to this knowledge system around colonialism and, and the real history of, you know, the Americas in general as early as possible, right? Because ultimately, it does give us um, the situational awareness to be able to navigate 
not only at university, but just the world we're living in, right? It structures the problem for us. Um, so yeah, history, colonial history, understanding settler colonialism, that's very real important content that, that should be fostered for Indigenous students earlier, the better. And even in informal settings, like it doesn't have to be a class, like it could be in a student club format. Like I know the Indigenous Student Union at USASC has amazing ideas on how to foster community um, and, and how to sort of of get these ideas mobilized in, in their student population fairly early on so that they're not taking advantage of so they're not put into positions or into disciplines that you know limit their potential um so sooner the better yeah sooner the better is the key thing here yeah yeah cool thanks for that um one other key thing that came up too just in my experience and my observations of, of where we're at in terms of the academy and indigenous students is that mentors must establish trust safety and maintain the rapport with students um, because universities aren't necessarily um, apolitical they're very political they're very political in terms of not only administration but also just in terms of the politics of the territory they're living in so we know at USAS very like we know from experience that you know the, the racism and and the social issues make their way onto campus like we experienced that very early on so we have to depend on our mentors our support staff um, I know I did as a as a uh, graduate student there where I had to you know sort of develop my own healthy support systems in the t in within the institution in particular um and it, it was it was almost like an informal process and when you meant mentors or you meant people who are in formal positions um you sort of have this in the back of your mind of like where where are they in terms of some of the issues we're facing on campus where are their politics All right so that's why for me as a long distance coordinator i'm i'm um, my, I concentrate more so on having the rapport with my student than I do with the professor or instructor. Um, I concentrate more on where they're at, not only mentally and emotionally, but even socially, like how's your life going? You know, what's going on for you in the real world? Um, and yeah, we could work on your paper and, and I could tutor you with your writing, but I really want to see how you're doing first and foremost. So that type of trust, that type of safety, that type of rapport, not necessarily like the, the, the standard guidance counselor approach, but literally like an ally in, in the trenches of, of a colonial system and within the colonial chaos of how are we going to get to do this together? Are you strong enough right now? Right. And, and concentrating and zeroing in on that dynamic first and foremost, I think is, is a very real important aspect when we look at at mentorship programs or looking at programs that are wanting to foster student support because we're really good at doing writing tutor stuff right we're really good at doing like the the math tutor stuff right and public speaking little workshops things like that but literally that confidant and that mentorship approach i think is something that we have to continue to um, improve on and, and maintain that student rapport is key that student rapport is really key um facilitation experience helps so students, uh, this goes out to Indigenous students uh, right now, the, the sooner you, you, you get comfortable hearing your own voice, the sooner you get comfortable comfortable standing in front of that room and facilitating, you know, group dynamics, um, the, the easier, you know, it's going to come to you later on and, and the more um, powerful your work and presence is going to be. Um, you, need, you need to be able to articulate your story. You need to be able to create spaces for what needs to be said. And a lot of that's going to require facilitation because even in classroom settings, right, it's going to be sometimes a very hostile space and very uncomfortable space. So how are you going to facilitate your way through that and facilitate your, your peers um, through those conversations to get on the other way, to get out on the other side unscathed or at least with very minimal damage? Because we do know that those types of spaces could cause damage. Um, they could um, elicit trauma responses and things like that. So learning how to facilitate and, and have conversations is really important in terms of just having to get our students strong enough to be able to navigate these systems again. Um, and again, facilitation helps you maintain overall safe spaces of inquiry, right? You become an asset to your community, you become an asset to your peers, and ultimately if you're a staff or even uh, somebody who's working with students on the other side of the desk, Ask. That's a very key aspect is we need quality facilitators and we need quality facilitation to, to work in these spaces. Um, and yeah, that sort of ties into the mentor's approach also is maintaining that rapport. Um, multiple access points to resources and supports. Um, I did hear a critique in the last year that, you know, um, in terms of helping Indigenous students that, well, we already have that at the school, they just need to access it. Cool. Yeah, we could, you know, we could refer them to that space or whatever program or whatever resources there. But 
for me, setting up multiple access points for students to access mental health supports, uh, scholarships, and things like that. Um, we need those multiple access points. Like we just want to let students know that we're working on in terms of giving them the best uh, resources we, uh, we can and that they could access those. So one of the cool things we did in my current uh, program I'm working in, the Indian Teachers Education Program, is we hired, they hired two long distance coordinators, right? Two of us working in tandem to be able to work with these students, check in with them, and again, developing those multiple access points, not only just um, with like mental health on, on campus, but they have access to us also, right? So there's multiple access points for Indigenous students to sort of um, get access to in terms of what every type of support they need. And we do a lot of stuff. We do a lot of tutoring, we do a lot of coaching, we do a lot of um, simply just mentoring them through problems, helping them navigate even the syllabus all the way down to the bare basic bones of the syllabus, all the way up to like final paper stuff. Um, and just talk story, like literally just talk story. Like we do a coffee house every week. Uh, we set up uh, WebEx meetings for one-on-ones and just see where they're at for the week. Um, so multiple access points to resources and resource people and supports is a very important um, aspect in terms of how we could support Indigenous students to navigate these systems. It can't just be one. It can't just be the referral card, right? Um, yeah. Getting the resources to the right place. Um, I really want to hit home the fact that um, you Sask right now, the Indigenous Student Union is creating an Indigenous Student Union, right? Because they felt the need in the wake of um, the Gerald Stanley trial and, and uh, my Cormier verdicts a couple years ago that we would be best equipped to help our own, our own people. Like we would be best equipped to offer the mental health support to our own students. Um, so why don't we have a conversation around an Indigenous Student Union? And they did. And they're still leading that fight and that charge to create their own sort of like administrative student body to be able to get the resources to the right places because who best knows the Indigenous student community? It's the Indigenous students. Right? Um, so that's a really cool initiative. So getting those resources to the right places, not only dollars, but just also um, um, programming and things like that is a very important conversation because sometimes um, students, again, like I said, they can access those to various reasons. So those multiple supports, getting those resources to the right places, is a really unique approach that um, I see taking place at USASC right now that I want to give a shout out to those Indigenous students who are leading that charge because it looks like it's a cool model that could work. Um, Trauma-informed approaches in general, like this is sort of like the life skills coaching me coming out, um, but mental health supports are key. Multiple access points to mental health supports are key. Um, you can't just be get your Indigenous students on the list to see a non-Indigenous mental health therapists, not discounting to non, not discounting on Indigenous mental health therapists, but I mean, there's rapport. Um, like we highlighted the colonial chaos, we highlighted the academic chaos students are navigating. Um, they need those mental health supports and they need multiple access points to those mental health supports. Cultural supports, you know, a lot of programs are really great at offering these two elements, um, but also just in general team efforts and accessible to, who are accessible to each other. Um, is, is really important, like a team-based approach to helping Indigenous students, I find, and I see working best. Um, not necessarily concentrate on towing the academic or administrative line or concentrate on grade, grades, but literally concentrating on the mental health and well-being of the student. So it's a whole different type of tutoring approach. Uh, yeah, you know, we could work on your CMOS format. Yeah, we could work on your APA format. But at the same time, let's have a conversation about <laughs> what's going on in the real world for you because that's going to interfere with your studies first and foremost. So literally this trauma-informed approach is really informed by who we are and where we come from as Indigenous people. I know you two have a really amazing podcast that highlights, you know, the social work elements and the social components that goes into sort of healing work and goes into, you know, the reality that a lot of our Indigenous people are going through. So that type of approach, I think, is really key for Indigenous students in general to have access to that type of discourse um, that just simply isn't academic, that simply just isn't administrative, but is literally there with the one-on-one -on -one approach of, of helping a student navigate the colonial chaos is, is how I would put it. Yeah. Mylon, do you mind if I dive in here for a second? I, while you were talking earlier and, uh, and as you've been speaking, I've been thinking about uh, something that I talk quite, uh, I talk a lot about uh, more specifically with my students and, and also with other folks as well as around historical loss thinking and how you know there was some work that was done um, at the University of New Mexico actually, and it was um, a study that looked at how often 
uh, Native American students thought about the losses that they've endured. And these mm -hmm. students, the results were really profound. And these students were in classrooms, at the gym, eating dinner, uh, raising their children at work, consistently and constantly being reminded of historical loss and the current loss. Yeah. And again, not to historicize loss, but to also consider it that yes, it started a long time ago and it still persists today. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a really important piece uh, when I work with my students is recognizing that um, while they're in the classroom, you know, trying to absorb content that they're also thinking about consistently and constantly mm -hmm. the losses that they've endured. So like being in a classroom where, you know, there is some colonial violence occurring and then how do you absorb, how do we expect students to absorb content yeah. and to get the grades that we, you know, expect students to get if they're exactly. not able to process what's going on and their trauma responses in relation to historical loss. And yeah. so it's so important for us to think about as educators or as support staff to students about there is always going to be that. And I use a backpack <laughs> and I ask a student to put it on and I start filling it up with heavy uh, bags of different things. And I put different losses on it. And I ask the student to imagine having to walk around the campus. And I mean, it's students do walk around with heavy backpacks, right? Around the campus. Yeah. But if you have to sleep with that, eat with that, go to the gym with that, raise your children with that, it is so important for us to think about, you know, how do we ensure that we are addressing that? Uh, first and foremost, like you said, checking in at a very different level, uh, rather than trying to go directly to content or to grades. Yeah. Yeah. Everything you said is on point. Like we're all on the same wavelength. We should all just uh, work together. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's definitely, on point. There, <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely on point because yeah, that's the fact and the reality of indigenous students is, is we've been through the history of colonialism, like I highlighted. And, and that's why I really like to talk about decolonization because it gives them something to look forward to, right. And to think about and to begin to theorize on the fly. But then when you're looking at these social, like the social histories of colonialism, colonization, and we, and like I highlighted is that those traumas are still very real it's still an ongoing dynamic they're not they're, that doesn't just exist in like the 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 social work class too it exists in you know the math requirement it exists in you know poli sci requirement so it's like they're going through their three classes in a day and, and that is with them right so they're thinking about it and it's and the conversations are coming from settlers right so they're going to have settler classroom or settler class mates and, and a settler prof maybe so it's still like a very real colonial dynamic that I, like we could even argue that 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 is still a very a violent way of getting our students to get an education is by yeah. you know putting them in these spaces where they have to sit and navigate these spaces and it, it, yeah it, it is like a form of colonial ongoing colonial violence that you know a lot of people are unconscious of right and again yeah like that's why i really like to advocate for checking in with our students. And, and that's what I've had the opportunity to do at, at the Indian, Indian Teachers Education Program is sort of fostering this relationship with students and and and, and see how they're not only, not only see how they're doing, but seeing um, what I need to do to get them through the door at the other end, right? Um, because like I said, I think I highlighted it earlier, I'll say it again, just in case I forgot, because I've been talking about this stuff a lot for the past few weeks. Um, we're really good at getting enrollment numbers and, and that data. Like we will advocate for that data and we'll say, oh, look, we have X amount of indigenous students in, in, in university this year. But then that, no, that number changes through midterms, right? It changes at the end of the semester, but we never hear about those numbers. Like we never get a good understanding of what happened to that student, what happened to these 15 students who didn't pass midterms. And of course the numbers vary wherever you go, but it's still a very real concern for me, not only as an educator um, on, and as a, as a mentor, but it, it's concerning for me simply just because I'm, in, I'm also a part of the system and, and what am I doing to ensure that these students are safe and where do they go? Like, I don't know, <laughs> like, I don't know. And that yeah. concerns me as an indigenous person, right? Like what classes were they taking? What took place on campus? And I think we got to advocate for for sort of gathering data in that area or even getting institutions to think about that um, because if they're going about it the wrong way with the enrollment numbers. Right? I, like I wouldn't brag about enrollment numbers because if you've got lots of enrollment numbers and you don't have the support systems for those students, then that's a failing system. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I think that, you know, that was one of that's one of the things that I definitely have. Um, 
have had questions about when I think about the numbers at our institution in regards to uh, Indigenous students. You know, we started a new, we developed a new Pimachi Swin Foundation program that assists students and we have mentors in the program. Uh, the, the program itself is based in, in culture and ceremony. It has um, mandatory courses where we have a cohort of support of students mm -hmm. together. Um, and so we're, it's quite a new program, but what we are seeing now, you know, we've, we've been running it for about two years now is that we are, uh, once they're leaving us essentially within that first year and they are going into their chosen degree program, um, there is a drop off of students, right? And so, you know, we we need to do a program evaluation to kind of get a sense of again, like what's happening? What are we, what are we missing? Um, what are some of the struggles that maybe these students are experiencing once they leave the program? Hmm. Um, and how can we better equip ourselves and equip our students to be successful? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, and I think that's going to be the big shift and, and that's something I advocate for. And those are the numbers I want to see too, right? Even right. And it's cool you got those numbers that you know there's a drop. Um, but again, what, what took place there and why was there a drop, right? Because if we want to create a quality education system, we have to have those conversations. Um, and unfortunately, you know, there's some institutions and universities that may not want to have those conversations. And of course, there's going to be some that are. Um, and of course, there's, this is a nuanced conversation we're having here. But yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely on point. Um, and yeah, and again, the, within the past year of working in the pandemic, I really saw a need for this. Like I really saw a need simply because the pandemic was an elephant in the room, right? Is that, you know, when I started to recognize and see that some students were dealing with very real, um, uh, like uh, literally dealing with COVID, right? In the household or in the community and they're on lockdown in the community. And for me as like the, their mentor or their long distance coordinator support, for me to just to jump in and say, well, let's talk about your academic paper. It just <laughs> didn't roll off the tongue too good. So you'd be like, well, how are you doing? What's going on in your community? Um, well, do you need anything from me? And then I started to realize, man, this the mental health support and component here is, is key more than anything right now. And, and if anything, COVID-19 and the pandemic highlighted how that, that is simply just, you know, that's the reality of what our young, our students go through with colonialism in general. Right. Literally the reality they go through with colonialism in general is that there's issues around them in their community and their family system. And we're expecting them to sort of adhere to what the university requires them to adhere to without offering them the support to navigate it and feel safe enough to navigate, navigate it. Um, but yeah, this is this is like the conversation I want to have and the conversation I've been uh, I've been sort of promoting in the last few months of, of delivering this workshop and I've done delivered it for a few institutions. And they're really open to wanting to create those systems now. And again, I just sort of gave them the play by play, play from my perspective of working in university, understanding colonialism and decolonization. Um, but yeah, thanks for sharing that because that's it, that's that excites me is that you have those numbers and you notice it and it's there. So now I'm curious to see what happens <laughs> and how do we mitigate that drop off. Um, one key thing I wanted to highlight before we move into questions and comments is, is that we have to be mindful that there's career and there's familial collective goals in our Indigenous students. I recognize this working in both um, as an instructor, but also as a student in my, myself, is that for me, my academic discourse, um, obviously, yeah, I could increase my survivability, get a career, become a prof if I want to, but all, obviously, I also have very real familial family community goals. I want to address those issues of colonization. I want to find solutions. I want to implement decolonization. That's a collective goal, right? And, and career goals are based more off the individual, like very for very real reasons, right? Some people literally want want to increase their income which is very valid in a in a colonial world because we know we a lot of our people are in poverty and they want to go to university to um, increase sort of uh, job opportunities very real but at the same time there's still the familiar collective goals we have to be mindful of and, and a lot of students have a hard time navigating this um, in some of the conversations I had with them because it's like yes I want to go home and help my people um, but then at the same time it's okay you know I got a very viable career option in this part of in this part of the country so they're stuck in this sort of um give and take sort of discourse right and and, and for me i think one of the ways we solve and just highlight this um is is through the data like we talked about is is what is the student's goal because i've asked students i worked with what is your goal like do you want this degree to get a job or do you want this degree for a bigger social reason like are you 
are you part of the um, are you part of the revolution so to speak type stuff and 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 it's a really give or take like they're navigating this on the fly it's like what, what am i going to do for myself and for my people um and again and of course you know we know where some of what we made that I mean, we, we may have encountered this discussion on, on a personal level um and again you know this is a very real dynamic that a lot of students navigate in real time that we also have to be mindful of and again they're navigating this in the colonial chaos. And that's why having a conversation about decolonization very early on is really important um, to give them that tool and structure the problem that they're navigating. Yeah. Cool. Any questions or comments from the group or from the audience or from Amber or Thierry? I'll just say one quick thing um, before, uh, hopefully we have some good, more good conversation, but we did a podcast episode with uh, Dr. Sherry Chisholm, uh, who is the current president of the University of Blue Quills. And one of the nice. very cool, profound things that she said in our discussion with her was about how uh, Indigenous folks did not inherit money necessarily, but we inherited a lot of responsibility. And I think that that is one of the things that we see, like even when Terry and I talk about our post-secondary experiences and why we decided to do this and why, you know, Terry is going to continue to do this and, uh, and why we chose to, um, you know, get a degree, earn a degree. Um, and it, it has a lot to do with that inheritance of responsibility. Yeah. And I think that that's what you're, that's what I'm hearing is that, Many of our students come into programs, like you said, you know, to to obviously gain a career and and provide mm -hmm. for their families within the colonial you know structures that exist, but also very much you know you hear a lot of our students talking about giving back to mm -hmm. community and wanting to ensure that they can give back to community in a very meaningful way, and yeah. so uh, thank you for pointing that out. Amber yeah. actually really wanted to inherit money though. <laughs> <laughs> I think that becomes I, I feel that becomes clear like because I'm 34 now and I feel that has become clear in the last five to six years like because I, I wasn't really mindful of it in my 20s right because that's just who we are and how we live as indigenous people you kind of grind and do what you need to do but then when you have colleagues or, or classmates or you know people in your professional circle who are non-indigenous suddenly getting houses or, you know, suddenly driving a car that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily be able to afford. You're like, where does that coming from? And it's, it's structural, right? So you realize that. And yeah, because I'm at the generation now where a lot of my friends and colleagues have been grinding and, and wanting to buy a house. So we're having those big conversations and things like that. And yeah, and literally like even this um, concept of a starter home, we were having, we we're joking around about a starter home and because realtors say it would be make a great starter home. And and <laughs> me like being a native, I'm like, what a starter home? I'm like, you mean I could have multiple homes, the house in my life type thing? I just want one for life. <laughs> so stuff like that right it's very real what you're starter, saying a starter home is like the cheapest home that you can get on the market with like one bedroom it's like, so basically a house on the <laughs> yeah yeah and, but it's very real is that you know we don't we don't have these final financial conversations till later it seems sometimes because we we are driven by that familial collective um uh, yeah, responsibility yeah. um but yeah then i think even one time a realtor said um she highlighted the fact that a lot of non-native families actually get their down payments covered through their family and i was like what like how are you getting like a, that big down payment or that big um you know that big chunk of money for a house and it's just like yeah well also very very real conversation that we we should have in general but yeah it does play mm -hmm. out yeah it I does play out. i agree yeah i agree i love the um the idea of having uh the long distance mentors uh which i think is really fantastic and so you and there's your your role is there's two of you 
Yeah, there's two of us and we split up our first years and second years. And this was nice. specifically a big push by the, uh, the Indian Teachers Education Program. And, and I mean, I don't know how much I can talk to you about some of the things that took place, but there yeah. was a big push to get these mentors in this position for the pandemic because we knew our Indigenous students were going to struggle. Um, yeah. And, you know, we everything was unpredictable at that time. And, and we got the position and yeah, it's been great. It's been like a whole different sort of approach to how I'm working with students outside the mm-hmm. formal setting. Um, and very real like physical problems too, like bandwidth, right? Having conversations yeah. on technology and having conversations around literally like sitting at your desk all day. So it was a very different angle. Like I said, it just highlighted the elephant in the room. And I realized, hey, there's something bigger taking place here and that this position's mm-hmm. really unique. And I do know that um, our, depart- our our program head right now, she is advocating for the positions to um, ideally, you know, one day maybe become permanent, but also to continue into the next year because it's been, it's been intense. Um, <laughs> It's been vital, but it's been intense. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think one of the really important things that um, I would like to stress is that there is, you know, because there's a number of Indigenous mentorship programs and organizations um, and, and, and things like that across, across the country. And I think that oftentimes the question that I'm always asking is, is the A, the, the mentor is actually Indigenous? Mm-hmm. And when mm-hmm. we think about the mental health supports, are they Indigenous as well? Because I think it's really important that when we are thinking about developing these support systems and these programs within, um, within our centers, that we are hiring Indigenous people. And I always stress that regardless of, you know, whatever the program is, there is definitely a connection that is made that I have seen when we are able to bring in an Indigenous mentor versus a non-Indigenous mentor or an, even an Indigenous mental health support. And you touched on that. And I think that's really important, you know, especially right now, we have a number of, of mental health supports um, at our institution, um, but we don't, I don't even think we have an Indigenous, me and Amber were just talking about that. We don't have an Indigenous mental health support uh, therapist within the institution. We do have within our center, we do have our elders. So oftentimes our students are coming rather than going to our wellness um, and psycholo- psychological center, they are accessing our elders instead. Mm-hmm. And so again, that speaks to the need of ensuring that we are um, creating those opportunities uh, for students specifically. Exactly. And I would even, I would even say further to that, that like for myself who like I, I teach, I'm, I teach within the program of social work. And I think that one of the things that came very clear uh, was that I was doing that work as well. So while I was, you know, facilitating classroom spaces and mm-hmm. providing, you know, you know, the, the lectures and so on, I was also providing the mental health mm-hmm. supports yeah. and, uh, I don't know if anybody is aware, but, you know, <laughs> faculty don't get paid all that great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so, you know, a lot of the stuff that I continue to do, I do because it's important. It yeah. is important to ensure. And I remember a story and my sister um, went to the University of Alberta and she was sitting in one of her very first classes and she was pregnant with her son at that time. Mm-hmm. And she said the instructor, the professor walked into the classroom and the first thing that professor said was, half of you are gonna fail this course. And uh, you know, that's the reality. (laughs) It's the same, yeah. I'll get it it for you, I'll I'll get it for you. But he walked in and he said, half of you are gonna fail this course and that's just the reality. Mm -hmm. And my sister started her, her class Uh, pregnant with her son, uh, the only Indigenous person in the class, uh, with this deep-seated fear that she was going to be of that percentage that failed. And I remember when she told me that, and I thought, holy shit, like that's, I I, I never experienced that at Blue Quills. You know, not one person, Mm -hmm. not one of our professors walked in our classrooms and said, half of you are going to fail. Like, (laughs) that's just, what a way to start, you know, an educational journey. And so again, thinking about our Indigenous students who are already feeling displaced within academia, 
And then they are walking into classrooms where they're being told by pri primarily white male academics or scholars yeah. that they are, someone's gonna fail. And, and that we know when we look at our statistics and we look at our data, that it is our students of, of color who do struggle significantly with writing, et cetera. And it's not because our students of color are not bright people, extremely mm -hmm. bright, but having to, you know, do this whole, um, you know, cognitive imperialism where we measure, you know, how smart you are yeah. by how well you can read and write the English language. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's shit, right? And, and I, I know I'm cussing, but that's okay. Um, but I think that- oh, I wish you um, told me that before, just <laughs> <laughs> Disclaimer, after the fact. <laughs> Uh, but but I think it's it's really important for us to think about how in which we come into classrooms. And I swore to myself when I started teaching that I would never, ever walk into a classroom and look at my students and say to them, half of you are going to fail. And if anything, I walk into my classroom saying, we are going to have a successful term. You're yeah. going to do well. You're all going to do well. And I'm here to support you in that. And again, knowing that a lot of my students can come to me and say, hey, Amber, this is what's going on in my life. Um, and I think that's so important that we consider that as educators as well. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. You said something there that really stood out to me too, is that you you two went to Blue Quills and 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 that being a tribal college. And I also went to a tribal college in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And again, exactly the same feel. Like I, I didn't realize how academic academia was until I left the tribal college and entered, you know, mainstream academia. And yeah, it's, it's, it, it can get really toxic and unsafe. And for me, that is an unsafe environment, right? That is an unsafe environment for our students. And, and, and I feel like, you know, that we do have to, um, what is it? We do have to be whistleblowers about this to our students early on and have honest conversations about this, because if, if, if this isn't the case, like if we're just, you know, ranting and raving, then the assumption is that there's nothing wrong with the academy, then it's the indigenous students who are the problem. Right. right. And, and that is, I feel that is the assumption that a lot of women take. Mm -hmm. And, and that's just not the case. Like we're highlighting here, there's colonialism, there's chaos, there's trauma that we're all trying to navigate. And, and we need to focus on giving our students the best support we can for them to get through that, whatever, with whatever they want to do, whatever program they want to take and, and be at, like, we need to be in a position to foster them authentically on, on a one on one level. Um, and, 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 you know, I'm really senile now because, you know, I am entering ideally trying to get my PhD done and I don't know if academia, um, is, is the route for me, but I do want to get my doctorate because I do want to have these conversations and continue them. But I mean, I, I like, I, if it, if it, if ac academia does, ex uh, change at certain institutions, cool, great. But just based off my research, my data, um, and my experience, in my theoretical frameworks, I don't know if it will. And I do feel like there's going to be a big shift to like tribal colleges in the future. Mm -hmm. um, like, like even in the United States, right? There, there's been black colleges for the last like hundred some years, right? I think that might be the big shift. And there's very real reasons there, those colleges existed at those times. Um, so I think that might be the shift that may take place in the future. Um, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, we can have a lot of conversations about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just wondering if there's any questions that we have from any of our participants. You can just throw it into the Q&A box if you have any questions for us. Yeah. Yeah, we have a moderator. So throw them in the Q&A and they'll host them for us and we could see them. While you're doing that, let's um, let's do a recap real quick. The goal today, this is actually a three workshop series. You only got like 1.5. Um, um, just to just to put that out there. If you want to hire me, you can. Just <laughs> if you're not back again, you can. Um, but the goal today was to understand the reality of Indigenous people in context of colonialism. Um, I I uh, I saw Terry and uh, Amber nodding their heads, so I feel we may have got that across. Um, and to better understand the chaos colonialism has on individuals, and and again to sort of shift focus to decolonization around, uh, give insight on how to better accommodate Indigenous students. Um, so that was the goal for today. I hope we met it a um, little bit different format for me today uh, but yeah that was the goal and I think we got a question do we yes yeah. we do 
How, oh, cool. if at all, would you adjust your approach for high school students in comparison to university students? Yeah, that's an awesome question because I love working in the high school. I am on a student services team right now uh, for Little Pine uh, Cree Nation, working in their high school. Um, I love working with university students, one key, or high school students. Um, one key thing I think that we have to keep in mind with um, high school students is um, we have to prep them better for university first and foremost if they want to go that route. Like we have to, you know, dot the T's and I's, so to speak, around the technical stuff. We need to have this conversation, like this type of workshop very early on, like even in summer programs to sort of just highlight the hostility that could potentially exist there. I think we're doing our high school students a disservice by um, getting them to apply to post-secondary right away and dropping them in the deep end. Um, because like we highlighted, like with the conversations here is, is it, it could be a shark tank. And if, if we're not building them up enough to be able to have these conversations and structure the problems, they may sink, right? They may sink. And I offer a summer program called Indigenous Schoolhouse where I specifically work with high school students in terms of getting them ready for university around these conversations and it's a two-week program and it's been successful and like I, I one of my big successes is I have a biologist that came out of um, Indigenous Schoolhouse and she does sciences now so it's really cool to see that um, but again just having these social conversations very early on with high school students giving them the life skills they need to be able to navigate the problems facilitate the problems problem solve and again just having very real authentic conversations that these systems may not be the best systems for us, but if you want to go and navigate them, here's the tools you need to navigate them, and here's what you need to be aware of. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. All right, let's see if we have, I think that's the only question that we have in the Q&A here. Yeah, that's all we have. Um, so yeah, I uh, thank you, Mylan, for you know joining us today. I think that one of the things that you know I really appreciate having worked in a, a tribal institution and having you know now currently working in a Western institution, um, there's quite the difference. You know, there is quite the difference, and I and you made a comment in regards to you know high school students going right into um, Western academia right off the bat. And, and the struggle that they may, uh, they may experience. And I think that, you know, if there's any advice to students out there who, high school students specifically, you know, I would really encourage um, students to go into their tribal institutions, whether that is, you know, the University of Blue Hills, Muskogee's Cultural College, Yellowhead, YTC, that's in the Edmonton local area. It's so important that you know we we are teaching some of those foundations and those connections to identity, history, and culture in those spaces first um, before going in. I, I and I say this because actually I came to McEwen uh, when I was 18. I think I was yeah, it was 18 years old, and you know it was just such a shock. It was such a shock to me. Um, and I ended up withdrawing after a year and a half. That's so funny uh, but, to say that. Yeah. And struggled. You know, I went through that yeah. first year, but oftentimes heard about our people or Indigenous people as, you know, the, the issues with Indigenous populations in, in this country or in this province. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that's, that was my first experience and exposure in education and post-secondary education. And I think that it would have been, you know, different if I would have stayed within a, a, a tribal institution for my yeah. school. It's funny you say that though, because I did do, I also went to University of Saskatchewan for one year um, before making jumping ship and going to the Institute of American Indian Arts in similar circumstance. I was like, I don't know if the space is for me. And that would have been 2007 I think um yeah and then now I'm still contending with that beast because now I'm doing my PhD there and there's still very real problems that we're trying to navigate and offer supports to our students um yeah it's interesting you said that because very similar circumstance mm -hmm. so yeah it's and it's cool you're openly advocating for tribal colleges and, and I do all the time also I say look into a tribal college if you can right that, that gets your foot through the door gives you the foundation you need and there's nothing wrong with them because even through my master's and even to this day, I still kind of get, I still sometimes get um, 
I, I, I don't know what it would be like. I, I sometimes get questioned a bit because people are surprised I went to a tribal college. Um, and, and yeah, like it just seems like, you know, people tend to have that view of tribal colleges in that way, which is unfortunate, but no, they're definitely like valid learning uh, spaces that, that literally like what we talked about today, it, tribal colleges are already, are ideally already addressing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're ahead of the game in many ways. Oh, completely. Yeah. Completely. I think about, you know, some of the, when we think about curriculum development right now with Indigenous, Indigenous specific uh, curriculum development, um, you know, our tribal colleges are way ahead of, of that. Yeah. And we're so far behind within, yeah. you know, these institutions that, yeah, there's, yeah. there's still lots of work to do, but we, I think, I don't think we have any more questions. So we're just gonna wrap up. Do you wanna maybe, um, should we dance? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I was teasing Mylan before. I said, I'm gonna, I started playing some music. I'm like, all right. <laughs> and Mylan, who's your favorite podcast? Let's just hear that one more time. Uh, my favorite podcast. I have lots of favorite podcasts. I, 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 I uh, you put me on the spot. It's a radical <laughs> narrative for sure. Just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, two, 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 yeah. Two, two, two's in a pod. I mean, it's you're doing, you're filling a gap. You know that I mean, the conversations that are taking place they are accessible to everybody, and it's just like it's it's filling the gap. Then those conversations we need to have. Um, so I, I enjoy listening to it. Um, I haven't been commuting as much, but yeah, it it was on my, it's on my downloads. So I still got to catch up on some episodes, but it's there when I'm driving to town. Yeah, yeah. That was that was totally self serving of me. I apologize, but yes. <laughs> Uh, no, but thank you. And, and, um, and, and, you know, I think, um, thank you again for, for joining us for this conversation. There were so many things within the conversation um, that you said that are really going to stick with me and things for, for, for me to think about um, as I move forward into, to more, and especially around that conversation of land back. And, um, and it's so important because that, that is one of the biggest questions uh, in my fourth year program or the fourth year program that I teach in. Uh, we have conversations about land back and how do we do that within office spaces? How do we do that within every space that we're in? How do we consistently um, you know, move towards land back, right? And, and that can look, yeah. So I just, anyway, my mind's going. And so thank you for that, Mylan. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's it's fun. It's always great working with you too, and and working at your institution where you're doing this working. And I always tell students to look into that program when they're in that neck of the woods, um, because yeah, it seems like you do um, hit a lot of the nails on the head around the problems I'm navigating. And just it's just great to have conversations with you too about this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we hope that you and your partner and your baby are safe, and that y'all stay safe, and uh, that you um, yeah that y'all stay safe. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Doing our best. You too. Yeah, for sure. Thanks again. Check, please check out Mylan's podcast, folks. Uh, I'm a huge supporter of podcasts, especially in post-secondary spaces. It uh, has just as much rigor as any other academic uh, journal or article that you'll read. Uh, podcasts are podcasts have rigor, but anyway. Um, but yeah, so please do please check out Mylan's podcast. Cool. Thanks. For the shout out. Yeah, you too. Thanks for everything.